Hello, SBC family. Welcome to Home Church for November 8th. We are glad you are joining us as we continue our study in the book of Ephesians. Pastor Jacob will be bringing us today's message, so please take this time as we worship through singing and prepare our hearts for what the Lord wants us to learn and hear. We hope everyone is doing well and we continue to pray for the day when we can all gather together again. Have a blessed week. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done.
Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands, for better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. Church, what we've been getting to look at in the book of Ephesians is the gospel transformation that comes uh, as God's story interlaces with our own. And so as we've moved now into the second half of the book of Ephesians, we're getting to see how the gospel doesn't just make demands on our life, but it, it calls us to a new life lived with God. And he gives us everything that we need in the power of the Holy Spirit to live this out. And the sweetness of the gospel church is the invitation that we get to see today that God is helping us as we do what Pete talked about last week of putting off the old self and putting on the new. And so today in our text, Paul is going to paint a bit of a picture for us, kind of build this mannequin, if you will, of the new humanity and what it looks like to put off the old self and to put on the new. We learned last week that we're being transformed by the renewing of our minds in chapter 4, verse 23. And today we're going to see that that change of belief in our minds and what we know to be true begins to flesh itself out in our behaviors. I remember when I got to go to India a little over a year and a half ago or so, and we got to go see how uh, rug makers uh, wove these uh, just fantastic Indian rugs together. And the guys that we got to see doing it had been doing it for so long that they showed us their fingers and how the points of their fingers there were physically like winnowed to a point that their bone structure and their skin, their skeletal structure had actually all shaped itself to, to be modeled after this task of what they were daily doing. As this amazing image of as we follow Jesus more and more over time, it becomes our identity to be a Christ follower, a Christian, someone who looks more and more like Jesus, like the identity that he's given to us. The the longer these guys were rug makers, the longer and longer their bodies physically formed themselves to the task. And we're gonna get to see a bit of a picture as Paul paints that for us today. And like we've talked about before, the beauty of all of this isn't just that the, the law makes demands on our life, but gives us neither feet nor hands, but what God calls us to in Jesus Christ, the gospel story, something so beautiful. It bids us fly and gives us wings and that this is a life done with God, not merely for God. And this is what he invites us into today as Paul kind of paints this mannequin for us. And so we're going to get to see this transformation played out in a few different ways. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, and look there at the first transformation that he's going to nuance for us. And it's this transformation from falsehood to truth. He says in verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood, Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. See, how we came to faith in Jesus Christ was by hearing the truth. It was hearing and receiving the truth that actually invited us into this new relationship with God. We heard in verse uh, chapter 4, verse 21, Paul says that we have heard about him and we were taught in him just as the truth is in Jesus. So now one of our roles as Christians is to put off falsehood because it's the very truth that brought us life. We put off falsehood and we engage, we pursue truth. Falsehood is this idea of like telling lies. It's telling either maybe white lies or half truths or openly trying to deceive other people. Proverbs 12, says that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. He despises them. And see, we as Christians are neither to live a lie, nor are we to speak lies. I remember a professor of mine years ago, kind of using this illustration for lying. He said, when we tell a lie, what we do effectively is like create an alternate reality. Like we create a a fake universe in a sense, which we have to keep construing and constructing with more lies to try and hold it up as it's disengaged from what reality actually is. And as we create this universe, we ourselves have to become God over this alternate reality that our lies have created. And being God is a task that none of us are cut out for. And eventually this is going to crumble. 
So Paul says, put aside falsehood and instead speak the truth to one another. As it was the truth that welcomed you into life with Jesus, speak the truth to each other. Be honest with one another. Be people of integrity and speak the truth about Jesus and the goodness of the gospel to each other. And all of this, he says, is because we are members one of another. I mean, there's a way that we as the church are all connected into this. And so as one body, we either rise or fall together. I remember my kids and I uh, were just loving getting to watch the world's toughest race, uh, which is the, the series about um, just these, all these different teams of four people that were trying to, to race or just get across this crazy uh, trail that they had kind of cut through in Fiji. It was awesome to see all the different challenges that came up, but they set out the rules right from the very beginning. And one of the rules was, you guys, you either all make it or nobody makes it. Like if one person falls off, the other three don't get to keep going. You're a team of four and you have to keep going. And so there was this one team and a guy had fallen, he got injured on his leg. It was this open wound that, that got infected. And then he wakes up after a few hours of sleep one night and literally he cannot stand up. See, what had happened is he got hurt and he tried to just tough it out. Because of that, his wound didn't get dealt with and it got infected. And because of that, the entire team ended up being disqualified. You see, the whole team fell together. Paul says, put away falsehood and speak the truth to one another. Because we're all members one of another. Guys, we rise or we fall together. So let's speak the truth and be honest with one another. You see, lying, it always ends up turning against us. Falsehood always ends up caving in on us. Like the structure that we try and build to protect ourselves just ends up falling in on us. If you guys have seen the movie Tangled, you'll remember how Gothel uh, deceives and supplants and all the sort of different stuff to try and protect what she desires most and Rapunzel. But eventually it's those very lies and deceit that she puts towards Rapunzel that end up driving her away. At the end of the day, she loses the very thing that she was trying to protect. You see, for us, church, though, we remember that it's the truth that invited us into relationship with Jesus. And so it's the truth that we're going to continue to speak to one another as we put off the old self and we put on the new. The second transformation he talks about is there in verse 26. And it's this transformation from uh, sinful anger to being angry at sin. Let me show you. Look there at verse 26. He says first, be angry and do not sin. This is a quotation from Psalm 4, 4. Just look at the first part. He's saying, be angry and do not sin. You see, it seems like there's this anger which Christians are to feel, which is not the overflow of the sinful self, but actually uh, springs up from, if you will, like the soil of the regenerate heart. Like there's something about the Holy Spirit working in us that Paul can now look at us and say, hey, be angry, but don't sin. It's not this sinful anger that's governed by selfish desires. Like when something else hurts us, we want to protect ourselves. When things don't go our way, we want to bring out revenge against others. That's not this kind of anger. It seems to be like a godly anger. And it's an anger, I believe, that's governed by love for others, not by love of self. And it wants to protect what's good. I remember hearing a professor, a different professor now of mine years ago say that you cannot trust someone who doesn't get angry at sin. You can't trust someone who doesn't get angry at sin. This is this idea of godly anger. And, and what exactly does godly anger look like? Well, for us, it looks like getting angry at the things that anger God. Those things which twist and pervert and break and destroy the good creation that he's made. If it's injustice or oppression, if it's unkindness or falsehood, if it's deceit or divorce, all the things that God hates, sin which breaks apart his world, those are the things that godly anger is directed against. And we get to do this together. I remember my wife and I getting to go back to the uh, meet with some friends from the Bay, a mentor couple in our life. Um, and we had sin that had come up between my wife and I. And we were trying to deal with it, but too often we were button heads this way. And so we go and we meet with this mentor couple and we're there in Los Banos and we're sitting down at a restaurant. And they use this illustration where they say, hey, you guys are sitting next to each other shoulder to shoulder. They say, your enemy is not the one next to you. 
It's this sin that's come into the relationship. And they say, think of this ketchup bottle. They put it right there in the middle of the table, which is perfect because I despise ketchup, right? They say, this is the issue. Focus your energy, not against each other, but come together and focus your energy against this sinful issue that's coming between us. See, when we get angry at the right thing, it can help us actually to reconcile with each other, to come against the things that are breaking us apart. It's this righteous anger. And part of righteous anger is not merely that we get infuriated at evil, but that we grieve it as well. You think about Jesus and he goes into the temple, right? And we have this, uh, if you've read through the story when he's like throwing over tables and, you know, he's throwing the, the money co- changers, uh, their stuff all over the place, right? He's like beating folks with a whip to beat them out of the place and so forth. We see this righteous anger, angry at how God's good uh, temple was being corrupted. But it's that same Jesus that as he's approaching Jerusalem, he weeps over it. See, righteous anger both is infuriated at evil, but it's also grieved by it. See, in my own life, I don't know about for you guys, but at least for me, too often, I get really angry at the small things. But the big, grievous evils that break the heart of God, I don't give the time of day to. I'm not willing to weep those things, but I get infuriated over just the little things. Like the other day, there's this light in our kid's bedroom that I've tried to fix a few times, but the wires don't seem to connect, right? And so you have to go up and like shake it to get the thing to turn on, right? And you go and you get it to turn on and then you go to do what you wanted to do and the light and all of a sudden it turns off. And I was just getting so irritated at this light, how it kept going off on me, right? That you just want to shake it harder and you just want to shake it harder. It doesn't go very well at the end, right? But I was getting so infuriated about this this little inconvenience of a first world problem, the light wouldn't stay on. And you guys remember, and just a few weeks ago, a friend of mine was sharing with me how 545 kids at the border had been separated from their parents and they couldn't be found. I mean, here's a grievous injustice. And I wasn't moved to anger to do something about that. The stinking little light just gets my panties in a wad. Come on. But Paul says part of the new humanity is to be angry, but not sin. I think it says be angry at sin. And then he goes on after this. What does godly anger look like? I think one of the things that we can do foremost to be angry and not sin is to get angry at our own sin and to grieve it. To get angry at the sin in ourselves, if, as Jesus says, right, to, to take out the log in our own eye before we look to the speck in our brother's. He goes on then in the the kind of third transformation here, which is moving from revenge to reconciliation. And look at it this way. Halfway through verse 26, he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now ask yourself, what is it that sparks anger in you? I mean, maybe it's frustration, like a light not turning on. It could be conflict with someone else. It could be depression or disappointment. It could be loss or misplaced expectations. Maybe it's exhaustion or just selfishness. All these things that happen in life that our response is just to get angry and respond to folks around us out of anger, not out of love. And our anger, one of the things about it is it seems to heat up really quickly, but often it it cools down very slowly. And in our anger, we can be extremely self-justifying. So we give every opportunity to the devil because angry people just do some of the dumbest stuff. We do things that are just outright destructive and we feel justified in it, right? If it's breaking or destroying or throwing something or, or speaking words intentioned to hurt someone else. And we justify it out of this rage and anger within us. But Paul says to put our anger to rest. I mean, daily before the sun goes down, don't hold on to it because holding on to anger, it clouds our judgment and gives opportunity to the devil. See, holding on to anger is actually an invitation, he says here, to sin. And so prolonged anger clouds our judgment and invites the devil in. Psalm 37, eight says this, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. 
It says, don't hold on to anger for too long because even if it's righteous anger, you and your sinful self are gonna go in a sinful direction with it. So no matter the length of your fuse, put it out each night. If it's long or short, put it out. Put it out. See, too often we hold on to anger because the justice that was done against us, it infuriates us and we're hurt by it. Paul says, before the sun goes down, surrender your anger to God. This is actually the first step in beginning to forgive and reconcile others is surrendering justice to God. Rather than taking revenge ourselves, we seek reconciliation and surrender revenge to God. And think about God's compassion here, church. I mean, this is beautiful. God is actually telling us, he's inviting us to give him our anger so that we can rest, so that we can go to sleep. And while we rest, God neither sleeps nor slumbers. So we entrust rage and justice to God, whom it says, never take vengeance, my beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. So we surrender our anger and vengeance to God. So instead, when we rise in the morning rested, we can choose to love our enemies, to feed those who are hungry. And if they're thirsty, then give them something to drink. Surrendering our anger leaves room for the justice of God so we can pursue reconciliation with others. This is another way that we put off anger and we put on pursuing reconciliation with others. Just as much as we put off uh, sinful anger and we put on righteous anger. The fourth transformation is in verse 28. And this is transformation. It's a beautiful picture that moves from being people who steal to being people who are generous. Now, so far, Paul has addressed each one of you. He said that back in verse 25. But now, all of a sudden, he begins to speak to the thieves. Now, this is really interesting because I assume that maybe not everyone there is, <laughs> is a thief that he's speaking to. And yet he addresses them particularly. But what's interesting about it is that he paints this picture about the thief that's just this image of total transformation. And it's this beautiful thing. Look in verse 28. He says, let the thief no longer steal. So put that off, stop doing that. But rather let the thief labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. See how complete this picture is? He's talking about a thief who's to put off taking from other people. Instead to pursue it, to choose to get a job, to work hard, to labor with his own hands. But not just so that he can have something for himself, but so as he's looking around and he sees other people in need, he's gonna have something to share with them. Church, this is what the gospel invites us into. This is the kind of transformation that the Spirit of God wants to bring about in your life as you participate and bring your story in with the gospel story, to see this transformation take place in your life. And what's so beautiful about this picture of the thief is that regardless of your past, regardless of where you are even now, God is able to take you and completely change you, to completely conform you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, to take thieves and turn them into folks who look after the needs of others, with generosity springing from the work of their own hands. I mean, he could take murderers and turn them into preachers of the gospel who bring life to other people. See, regardless of where you are right now, regardless of your past, God is able to bring about this transformation in your life. How beautiful is that? Better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and it, it gives us wings. So then the fifth transformation is here in verse 29. Look there. And it's this transformation from words that tear people down to words that build people up. Verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Have you ever poured milk into a bowl of Cheerios? Or better yet, Lucky Charms. Let's go there. And then you take a bite and you just want to spit it out because the milk is sour. Worse yet, it's chunky. Has this ever happened to you? You know that taste or even just the smell of like spoiled milk? It's that same sort of word here that he uses when he talks about corrupting talk. It's the word that they would use for like, you know, if it's spoiled milk, if it's putrid meat or rotten 
fruit or or <laughs> just spoiled fish. It's this idea of like corrupting talk that's coming out of your mouth. It's foul and it's rotten. He says, those are the kind of words that spite people, that jab at them, that scorn them and gossip them and slander other people. He says, don't let any words come out of your mouth that would taste like that, like spoiled, rotten meat. And again, what's so cool about this, uh, this picture that he's painting for us, this mannequin of the new humanity, if you will, is that he doesn't just say, hey, put your foot in your mouth. But no, transformation is so much more than that. It's not just putting off the old self, but it's putting on the new. So he says, instead of those kinds of words, speak words that would build others up. I was listening to a friend of mine recently in his testimony he was sharing about how at his conversion, when he put his faith in Jesus, he began to notice how his vulgar language just began to die down. Now, he didn't go the extra mile here and say that it began to change to words that build other people up. But having known this individual and experienced firsthand his own encouraging words to me, I've seen that exact transformation in his life. I can believe from knowing what he said that the vulgar language passed away. And I've seen now the the fruit of words that build other people up coming from him. And it's this awesome picture of getting to see gospel transformation. And it's this active transformation. Maybe many of you, like, at least for me, you know, uh, growing up in this kind of homeschool family, you know, we went to church, we went to school with the same people, and we had these rules about all the words we're not allowed to say. There were bad words, don't say those words. And we had a whole list of them. And we had ways we tried to get around that a little bit, right? But we had this whole list of, of words that we were not allowed to say. And see, legalism goes that far. It says, don't say these things. But the gospel actually goes much further than that in inviting us to speak in such a way which builds other people up. It builds them up. And not just like with flattery, with insincere compliments or or speech or insincere praise. In fact, I once heard someone talking about flattery, said, hey, flattery is like perfume. Sniff it, don't swallow right? Flattery, it maybe plays as the small part, but that's not what he's talking about here. That's not how we truly build other people up. Rather, we're to speak in a way that is is kind and truthful, and it leaves people better than we found them. It praises them, it, it encourages them, it speaks well of them in maybe ways that they didn't see in and of themselves. And at least for me, too often I'm quick to spy out and to speak about things that are negative or false in other people. But often I'm far too slow to both discern others' gifts, their acts of kindness, the ways that they they give up themselves to serve other people. And I'm so slow to speak well and to be thankful for those things. And so I think each of us would do well here to actually exercise intentionality, not just about stopping the bad habits, putting off the old self, but putting on the new, just to sit and to think about our kids or our spouse, our our coworkers, our good friends, our parents. Write down, man, as we think about what are the things that we appreciate about them? What are the ways we've seen them grow or change or show kindness to other people? And how can we speak in a way that just draws that out, that speaks well of them, that builds other people up? As we think about it and write it down, we could just be prepared with that, just to slip it into daily conversation. Maybe it's writing a note, maybe it's something going so far as that. But even just if we're prepared with those things in daily conversation, just to slip in how we see God at work in other people's lives, how we see other folks giving up themselves to love others. Speaking of all that, in verse 30, uh, we want to be intentional about putting on the new self. There's something else we need to be intentional about here, and it's there in verse 30. Look there. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Church, I think we grieve the Spirit of God when we refuse to change from our old ways. Rather than exercising intentionality to put on the new self, When the Spirit calls us to go in a direction, to speak encouraging words, to to move us towards generosity, to move us away from stealing, we suppress it. We say, no, I don't want that. I don't want what God is calling me to. When we choose to live contrary to the life that Jesus is calling us to, that he died and purchased us for. 
The Spirit seals us in. When we do that, we grieve God. Church, let's not be a people who do that, who push God away and invite the devil in and give him opportunity. No, let's give no opportunity to the gospel and pray and so do in such things and ways that we would soften our hearts to respond to the call of God's Holy Spirit. So instead of grieving God, we tune in to where he's calling us. We tune in to what he's asking us to do. Again, this is the beauty that God wants to transform our lives. This is what he's purchased us for. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's bid us fly and he's given us wings. The Spirit of God is in your life at work to show you what God is calling you to. So be careful how much noise you allow in your life, which would deafen out and mute the sound of God's Spirit calling. Be intentional to spend time to listen to the Spirit of God, to discern what it is he's calling you to, to put off and to put on. And not just in your own life, but in the lives of those you love, those around you, in the lives of the church. Where is God's Spirit helping you discern where others need to be rebuked or encouraged and to do it in both truth and in love? Because church, this is the life lived with God, not just for God. Now, finally, as Paul kind of gives us this mannequin of the new humanity, he puts it all into one picture here in verses 31 and 32 in this summary of what the new life ought to look like. Some of these old habits and this old self were to put off in verse 31. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away along with all malice. Bitterness and anger often go hand in hand. When we're bitter, we respond in anger. When we hold on to anger, we often uh, feed into bitterness. Wrath is these outbursts of anger. Clamming, clamor is just like shouting at one another. Slander is uh, speaking in such a way to, to tear other people down, to destroy their reputation. He sums it up, he says, along with all malice, like putting this whole picture together of a life that's eager to destroy other people. But that's not what we as Christians are called to. So he says, put that away. Get rid of it. Throw it out. You see, all of these behaviors, they destroy humanity. They destroy harmony in life. And they aim to hurt other people. But Paul's already told us in chapter 4, verse 3, that we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So instead, verse 32, he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Be kind. Kindness isn't just being a a nice person or opening doors. It can certainly involve that. But we've seen in Ephesians 2, verse 7, that the kindness of God was his choice to send Jesus to suffer and die to save us. That's the kindness of God. It's not just being nice, but it's completely putting others ahead of yourself. Intentionally seeking their welfare, even at the cost of self. And yet this is the new humanity God is empowering us and inviting us into. And to do it, he says, tenderhearted, with compassion, feeling for the suffering of others in such a way that it motivates us to action. And to be people who are just eager to forgive one another. Not reluctant as we bite our tongue, I forgive you. No, we're to love forgiveness. Because it's God's forgiveness towards us that has welcomed us into this new life in Jesus Christ. We're to love forgiveness. The key to all of this is right after that. He says, as God in Christ has forgiven you. I mean, this is the degree to which we are to forgive, to be generous, to be kind, to be tenderhearted. to to put away anger, to get angry at sin and the things that destroy, to speak the truth. We're to do all of these things to the degree that God has done it to us. How much do we forgive? Well, how much have you been forgiven? Right, how generous are we to be? Well, how generous has God been? What has he withhold, held from us? Like, are, are we allowed to lie? Well, God is truth and he's spoken truth to us that's given us life. How kind are we to be? Well, God has given everything to pursue us and to put us and our welfare ahead of that welfare, even of his own son, Jesus Christ. As you see, it's to the degree that God has forgiven us and all of these things, just as in the same way, we're to do it to one another. 
But not only is this the degree, but this is the the motivation behind our forgiveness. Because we've been forgiven, because we've experienced the compassion, the kindness, the generosity of God, so we can act in such a way to, to, to behave the same towards other people. So we say at Sanger Bible Church that our mission is to love God and love others. But all of this, Sanger Bible Church, is because we know that God has first loved us. And in the same way that God has loved us, we want to love him. And we want to love others. Because God has loved us, we want to love him and to love others. I love how Tim Keller says it so simply. He says that we never move beyond the gospel. I mean, it's not just an entry gate into Christianity. No, all of Christianity is us going back to the gospel and remembering the degree of God's love for us is to motivate us to love others in the same way. And all of this is possible because God has given us his Holy Spirit, this transforming power of life with God to put off the old self and put on the new to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And so Christian, know this, God is at work in your life, transforming you. As Paul paints this mannequin of the new humanity of these things that we put off and we put on the new humanity, what is it in your life that God's spirit is calling you to put off, to put behind you, to move away from, to get rid of? And what are those things in your life that God's spirit is moving you toward? that he wants to shape you to be more like. This is the life God is inviting you into. We don't have to do it alone. We get to do it together. This is the the gospel life. For better news, the gospel brings. It bids us fly and it gives us wings. (laughs) 